you needed to share your screen for any reason. Angela, please go ahead. All right, on behalf of the Teaching, Learning, and Professional Development Center at Texas Tech, as well as the Teaching Academy here, we welcome everyone here and especially our guests from uh, Auburn University and from Southeastern Louisiana University and our own Brianna. Uh, um, so that I get this right, I, I will read it in just a second, but I wanna tell you that this, this session began because I was communicating with Brianna about something and I came across this fantastic article that she and her, some of her colleagues wrote. And I said, wow, this is really super. Uh, you need to share this. And so she is now sharing it. So let me get the facts straight. So I'm gonna read that. Teaching online is challenging. We learned this fact firsthand last spring when our institutions rapidly transitioned from face-to-face -to, -face to online instruction. The COVID-19 pandemic upended all aspects of ac academic life, really? And increased inequities and widened already present disparities. In spring of 2020, a group of 17 women academics from all over the United States came together to write an opinion paper about gender inequity in academic institutions in the wake of COVID. That paper published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences addressed the challenges faced by women faculty. It also served as a jumping off point for another paper, this one about equity in the online classroom and how to make online instruction more active and inclusive. Four of the, those original 17 authors, along with five additional women academics, came together to write an extensive article, that's just the one I'm talking about, about integrating active and inclusive teaching in, the, in an online or hybrid classroom. Their resulting article, and you've been sent the link, is full of practical tips and resources and was published in the special issue of Ecology, Ecology and Evolution, which focused on taking learning online. In today's session, Dr. Brianna Harris, a research assistant professor in biological sciences here at Texas Tech, Dr. Stephanie Shepard, an assistant professor of geosciences at Auburn University, and Dr. April Wright, an assistant professor in biological sciences at Southeastern Louisiana University, will share some of the highlights and practical tips from their paper. Here's Brianna. Awesome. Thank you so much, Angela. Um, and thank you all for being here. And just a little bit of good news. So as of like an hour ago, I got an email. I am now research associate professor. Yay. So yay, super cool. Um, but yeah, we're delighted to be here and happy to share um, some of the work we've done. So I'm gonna um, share some slides that, that we prepared. Um, I think I'm gonna do kind of the bulk of the initial talking, but um, my co-authors are welcome to jump in at any time. So if you hear it switch, that's why. Um, and then at the end, we're each going to share some of the things we've done this semester in our own classrooms and leave some time for questions. So that's kind of the, the quick rundown. Okay, share my screen here. Have to do the obligatory. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, okay, fantastic. All right, so we've already covered who's here and, and the topic for today. Okay, so um, as Angela mentioned, this um, webinar is inspired by um, this paper that we all wrote. Um, these are the um, authors on the paper um, listed here and shown here in photo. The three of us highlighted in red are the ones presenting today. Um, on these slides, you'll see on the bottom this QR code. And this is just a way to um, give you at home if you want access to some of our links quickly. Just take your phone and open up the camera and scan that QR code and it will pull up the corresponding information for you um, on your phones. You can email it yourself or whatever. So we have a few of those inserted just to, to tell you why those are there and how to use them. Okay. Um, so the focus of our paper, as, as the title implies, is really the integration of active learning and inclusive teaching. So a lot of us have heard of or are familiar with or use active learning in the classroom. So this process of engaging students in their learning experience. We may or may not be as familiar with inclusive teaching, but this idea of making sure that your classroom and your strategies serve all students. Um, we really wanted to focus on the overlap of these two areas, particularly in online education, because not all active learning activities are inclusive and not all inclusive strategies are active. So we're really trying to hone down these concepts and focus on the overlap. Um, just a quick outline, I know I said it at the beginning, but what we're going to do today, so walk through a few slides on what's active learning and why should you use it, 
what's inclusive teaching? What are some strategies to increase both active and inclusive teaching? What are some common challenges and solutions to doing this? A few examples that we've used in our classes, kind of what works and what we're still figuring out, and then Q&A. And um, this is kind of a wordy slide, but these are kind of our goals or take home points that we think that you all listening today will be able to do or take with you or know or be able to do when you leave. So define active learning, inclusive teaching, equity and equality. Give examples of both active and inclusive teaching strategies. Discuss a few challenges of and solutions for implementing these in your classroom. Locating a few key resources to help you design and implement both active and inclusive teaching. Appreciate the difficulties of changing the way we teach. Give yourself some slack and be okay with starting small. It's, it's overwhelming, absolutely. Um, and then last kind of a challenge is to devise a concrete action plan for how you're going to make one change next time you teach, whether that's an active or inclusive or one of those and how you're going to do that in your syllabus. So kind of a challenge to you going forward. So what's active learning? Um, again, that's it's kind of been a term for a while. It's probably something we've at least heard of. So this is really the process of engaging students in their learning. So instead of them just being the traditional, what we tend to think of college classroom, right? Sage on the stage, the one up front, delivering content, just, just like I'm doing right now, delivering content to an audience of people, right? But active learning really wants students to manipulate that information, to grapple with it, to become involved, to have agency, to really be able to be involved in their learning process and being able to apply that information and take those concepts and do more with them than just regurgitate back. So it's kind of the framework overall of active learning. Active learning strategies vary. There are lots of different ways to do this. Um, some work better for some classrooms, some work better for others. They can go from simple to complex. So we're not gonna go through like all of these, but just some quick examples. So things that are pretty simple to do are like minute papers or think, pair, share. Minute papers, just what it sounds like. If you give students a couple minutes, either you say what's the clearest point or the muddiest point from today, or perhaps how are you connecting what you learned today to what we did last week or what questions do you have? Things like that. Um, think, pair, share, they answer a question, then they get with their neighbor, they talk about the answers, and then maybe they re-answer that question and see how collaboration with a peer helped. There can be things that take a little more work or organization from both the student and the faculty point of view. So doing like case studies or problem-based learning where students get in teams and solve um, questions or concepts related to their um, lesson. Maybe they review each other's work or do group presentations. And then things that get a little more complex are those where you're doing like um, course-based undergraduate research experiences, right, which have a lot of planning on the faculty side and a lot of work on the student side, or perhaps things like Wikipedia assignments, um, which one of our collaborators uh, does routinely in her class. So lots of different ways you can do active learning. You can do a lot, you can do a little mix of them, whatever works for your class. Why do we use it? Um, you're probably familiar with Bloom's taxonomy. If not, this is, this is kind of the updated photo. This is just a framework for organizing knowledge or content gains for students. We tend to think of these um, bottom portions of, of this triangle, so remembering and understanding. These are kind of the basics of your field, right? The vocabulary being able to describe just the general stuff of your area or of your content um, section. And then active learning allows us to get to these other verbs, these apply, analyze, evaluate, and create. So not only are students learning the basics, right? We need to be able to speak the language of the topic, but being able to take that information and really work with it, apply it, argue, um, compare, contrast, design, develop, right, to really work with that information. And you can cover all of these bases with active learning exercises. Um, why use it? I'm not gonna go through like all the literature. I just wanna highlight a couple points for why um, it's important in the classroom. So um, active learning enhances student learning. Um, what you're seeing here, don't worry too much about specifics. It's a graph of students from underrepresented minoritized populations and those from non um, underrepresented minoritized populations. That's URM and non-URM. 
what you're seeing on the y-axis is learning assessment based on gains um, from that specific course. And those who got active learning are in the light color, so light pink and light blue. And those who got traditional or passive learning are in the dark colors, so dark red and dark blue. So you can see that the light pink is higher than the red and the two blues are about the same. So this brings up an important point that active learning is helpful and is particularly helpful for reducing performance gaps. So this is something we see um, pretty consistently across courses, especially in STEM, where individuals that have the same level of preparation or training going in don't end up with the same outcomes overall. And one way to help with this is to use active learning. So again, this is from the same paper. Um, this is showing, again, the traditional and the dark blue, so red and, and this darker blue color, and the active learning in this light pink and light blue. And this is course grade um, overall. So same, same idea, same trends as learning gains, but also course grade. Um, along similar lines, this is um, a graph showing results from a meta-analysis. So several studies combined looking at course failure rate in classes with um, kind of traditional learning. So those in this peach or orange color, and then those in active learning. So we can see a shift in the percentage of students who fail the class with active learning reducing that. And again, this is a meta-analysis of several different studies across different subjects. And over here, um, again, really similar to this first panel, this is a recent meta-analysis, again, several studies included here. And what we see is the yellow dots are passive learning, the pink dots are low investment active learning, and then the purple dots are higher or more complex levels of active learning. And don't worry too much about the specifics, but what this graph is showing is that for students that are from underserved or minoritized groups, that exam score and overall passing grade increase with the level of active learning employed in the classroom. Um, and there's a lot of literature. You can email if you want more resources there. Um, just another quick thing, active learning aligns with vision and change. So the AAAS kind of strategy to really increase participation and student involvement and active learning is, is really on par with a lot of the changes recommended by um, American Academy of Sciences. The um, National Institute of General Medical Sciences and Howard Hughes Medical Institute formed a working group and they really pushed the idea of student involvement and active participation. And as did the um, American or Association of American Colleges and Universities, they listed this active learning as a high impact practice in a way in which to increase performance. So that's our spiel on why you should do active learning in the classroom. What about inclusive teaching? What's this? So this is kind of a philosophy of teaching that provides equal opportunities for all students to have a successful learning experience. So really making it so all of your students can succeed in the class and thinking what you need to do as an instructor to make that possible and make that happen. And in our paper, we talk about kind of these aspects of inclusive teaching. They're not necessarily mutually exclusive. There's overlap in the goals and um, how you implement these. There's also, I want to highlight, a really fabulous interactive website by Dewsbury and Brain. And if you want to access it, you can scan the QR code. But it walks you through kind of an interactive way to see what you can do in the classroom and what you're doing and what are some options to make your experience for your students more inclusive. Um, but the aspects of this we talked about in our paper, um, we highlighted universal design for learning which is really a strategy that takes into account, like how can I make this class the most accessible for everyone, right? So how can I make it so that everybody can have the ability to succeed and what are ways in which I can do that? Um, we can use trauma-informed pedagogy so or teaching. So this is really taking into account that trauma can impact the environment in the classroom and the way in which students are able to succeed or behave in the classroom. And we're all pretty familiar with like ongoing chronic stress and trauma of, of the COVID-19 pandemic, and that's hitting different populations in different ways. Um, and also the um, racial, racial injustice and the murder of George Floyd and kind of the social justice movement that occurred there. That's some ongoing, you know, pretty, pretty traumatic information that's impacting all of us. 
We can talk about culturally responsive teaching. So being able to make sure that all students are able to succeed, that they can bring their cultural experiences to the classroom, that we take that into account. We can think about students' lived experiences and that all students can appreciate different cultural perspectives and understand those. We can talk about mindset and expectation. So this is kind of the idea of growth versus fixed mindset. If you've listened to Carol Dweck or um, Sandra McGuire, kind of talking about how students view their abilities, whether they can change or not, whether I'm just smart or not smart, or, oh, this is challenging and that's fine and I can grow, right? That kind of attitude matters a lot. And it also matters for the way in which faculty view students or view themselves. So both student mindset and faculty mindset. And then last, a focus on equity. Um, that's pretty broad, but how do we make sure our course and our classrooms are equitable? So in terms of equity versus equality, right? So equality is giving everyone the same resources. Equity is giving everyone the resources and experiences or opportunities to get them to the same outcome, right? And I like this bike example just because it's really simple. And in equality, we give everyone the same bike. But for equity, we give individuals the bike or the tools they need to get to the same outcome, to finish the race, right? Because if you just look at equality, some individuals here aren't even able to participate based on what they've been given. So we can think of ways in which our classrooms can increase equity or can decrease equity based on what we give individuals. There are a lot of things in the chat. Okay, I think it's fine. I was just making sure I didn't need to address them. <laughs> All right. Um, so what can we do for equity in our classrooms, right? So what are some things we can consider for online equity? Um, we talked about this a lot as a group as we were working on this paper, and I'm sure there are things that have come up since we wrote this paper. But we might want to think about what types of devices do our students have access to? Do they have laptops? Do they have desktops? Is it just a tablet? Is it just a phone, right? Are they going to take their whole class on their cell phone, right? And, and what does that mean for how we develop content? Um, do students need to buy access to software, right? Are there like programming things they need to use? Um, can we use cloud-based software or servers where they don't have to pay, right? Does the university have subscriptions? Are we gonna ask students to buy clicker software or buy the book software, right? And then who, who can do that more easily or not, right? Thinking about those aspects. Um, we might wanna think about, there we go. Who has access to high-speed internet and an available bandwidth to stream or to use video conferencing, right? What students have that at home and what might not? What's an extra barrier we might be imposing on students if we make assumptions about what everyone has? Um, what about students that share um, networks at home, right? Maybe both of their parents or their roommates are all working from home and they're all using the same internet. Right? Or maybe they have to have a hotspot. Um, how does that factor in? Do they have certain plans where they have to pay for data? And who's using that data? How do we think about what requirements they need to have for our course? Um, perhaps, there we go. Um, what about accessibility of what we do post? However we decide to post information, what about accessibility of that information? Do we have closed captioning? Do we have screen re reader friendly documents? Do we have color schemes that are helpful for individuals with different visual impairments, right? Do we have access for students that have hearing um, differences, right? So how are students able to access the content we post? Um, do we require cameras and participation, right? This is a big one. Do we require them to show what's going on? What about telling them they have to have a background? What if they don't have kind of the streaming capability to have that going? I know sometimes I've turned off my camera at home because um, my internet's not great some days, right? So what does that, how does that rule impact equity um, for students? And then another one kind of related is, re are we gonna require proctoring software, right? Those are kind of anxiety provoking in general. There's also some racial issues with that because sometimes the software doesn't um, recognize different melanized skin types. That's a problem, right? Like that's not, that's not good for equity um, in our classrooms. And then kind of last, 
how are we going to think about um, due date flexibility and kind of the framework, especially during a pandemic? What if students are working? What if they have to work extra hours? What if they're in the service industry or they're essential workers? Are we going to have a synchronous or asynchronous class? How are we going to accommodate different due dates? All of these things, right, are important to think about in terms of equity. I see someone turned on my closed captioning, thank you. Um, so no matter what you decide or you determine is the best way for your class, make that explicit and clear and transparent to your students by putting it in the syllabus. You might wanna have topics such as internet or computer needs, what software or program, how many estimated hours per week do you think they'll be online on the computer? I mean, you, it is a guess, right? But like based on what I've assigned, I assume you're going to spend at least five hours per week like connected to the internet, right? Whatever that might be. Do they have to have a camera or a microphone? Do they have to attend, right? Are you gonna count points for that? What's your policy if there's timeouts or if they lose connection, especially during assessments? How are you gonna proctor? And also what's your late work policy, right? So all of these things think about and then just clearly um, explain to the students. Um, what about a couple strategies to increase active and inclusive teaching? I'm not gonna walk you through all of this. This is one of the tables from our paper. Um, I just wanna point out that we categorize things by AL or active learning strategy. We mentioned some online considerations and then some inclusive strategies or considerations. This is not by any means all encompassing or totally inclusive of options. It's just to kind of get people thinking. Um, one thing I wanna point out here is we said, okay, what if you use a minute paper, right? This is where students write or respond to a prompt or think about the clearest point or the muddiest point. Pretty easy to implement. You can do it in big classes, or small classes. And this could be beneficial and synchronous or asynchronous, depending on how students turn this in. You could also incorporate it with um, certain technologies. So things like PlayPosit or Edpuzzle allow you to insert prompts throughout like a video lecture. So that might be a way to increase engagement online. Um, and then different strategies, perhaps building on um, universal design for learning, you could tell students they could submit it in any framework they want. So they could write it, they could record themselves on a video, they could do a, an audio recording, something like that. We also have some kind of medium level of effort um, examples. I'm just going to talk about one very briefly. So like a public service announcement, these are kind of fun. I've done this in class. When you ask students to create a PSA relevant to some form of uh, your class topic, um, it's a little bit more difficult because you have to come up with the assignment and whatnot, decide how you're going to grade it. But they could do this in a variety of formats. They could do peer review. They could work together, right? You could use the learning management system to help design rubrics and to help with students to upload that. Um, and in terms of inclusiveness, you can use your rubric to increase transparency and expectations, right? So that's clearly available to the students. You could make sure your feedback is in line with promoting a growth mindset and easily provide feedback online, right? In the little comment boxes. Um, and you could also then allow students to use multiple um, formats to submit that assignment. And then last but not least, some of our medium to difficult or kind of hard to implement, just take more planning. So we had one of our colleagues that does a course-based undergraduate research experience. And I know if you're a TTU person that our true group is, is working to do that with, with faculty. So if you're interested, reach out to Levi Johnson or, or others that true. But um, this is where you really integrate research really heavily into your course. And it kind of dovetails off of what you're doing. There's a lot of papers on how to do this. Um, but it really does allow students to um, engage. And you can do this online. Again, it just takes some planning, but you might wanna have a dot cam or some way that students can use a microscope. There are some remote labs that allow students to control stuff remotely, which is really cool. Um, or they might use museum collections. And then thinking about inclusiveness, just kind of high-speed internet access, um, all those things with designing your course um, really come into play here because students are gonna need to be able to, to be involved. Fine on time, I think. A couple of challenges and pitfalls. Um, things we came up with were depth versus breadth, always an issue, right? No matter how you're planning your course. Where do I get stuff? 
right? Like, how do I get active learning activities? Um, oh my goodness, I don't want to overwhelm my students. I, I feel like this is a big one. Like, I want to have all this stuff, but how do I do it so I don't overwhelm them? Um, whose voice is heard in the classroom? So making sure it's not the same students all the time. Um, what if my students don't prepare in the same way? Like, what if they're, some groups come ready and others don't? How do I manage group work? How do I get my students to buy in? And what about like impacts on my course evals and buy in from faculty or my department or from the people that evaluate me? These are all discussed in the paper. We're not gonna go through all of them right now. Um, we do wanna highlight a couple. So I wanna use it, but I'm busy and I'm overwhelmed. Where can I get activities? Well, good news. There are a lot of ready-made activities out there. Um, we've created a table of them. These are primarily ecology and evolution because that's the journal, um, but a lot of them are broader um, and they do span fields. Um, also, I've noticed a lot of professional organizations have education resources. Um, and I didn't know this, but like before, but if you email or ask people they're like, oh yeah, yeah, we've got an online folder. So check your orgs, especially if you have um, teaching based discipline, disciplinary organizations. Like I learned there's this really great one for biology education. Also some really helpful Facebook groups. Um, Higher Ed Learning Collective is great. People are always asking for assignments and people are always providing them. So reach out, don't reinvent the wheel. Um, yeah, but yeah. I put one in chat that is, it started Perfect. out as the geoscience one, but it has a ton of basically from all approaches of science. It's a cert, cert carlton.edu. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, this is just an example of what the table in our paper looks like, kind of giving you the database and, and a description, but a lot of them are pretty general um, for the sciences that, that you could use if you're a science um, educator. And then one I do wanna just pitch um, because I found it super useful is the National Center for Case Study Teaching and Science. It's based out of uh, uh, University of Buffalo. And there are almost 900 cases on here, spanning topics, um, lots of different fields of study, they are peer reviewed, they come with answers and teaching notes and anyone can submit, um, kind of a plug there. I've used this as a active learning assignment and had my students write case studies and they've submitted them and now they are published authors at the database. So you can use it in two ways. It's pretty fun. Um, another pitfall, I wanna use active learning but my students don't like it. How do I get them to buy in? Yeah, active learning uh, does put a little onus on the student. They can't just sit there, right? They can't just come to class and like kick back. Um, they're often asked to be engaged and solve problems and apply. And sometimes they don't like that. Um, they tend to rate it that they are learning less, even though they're not, which is kind of frustrating. But um, what we can do is increase the inclusivity, right? Make it okay to fail, make it okay to struggle with this material, focus on the learning. Um, we can talk to them about metacognitive thinking and how important it is to assess yourself. We can be super explicit in our um, rationale and the way in which we're grading them. And I believe we have an author on our call of this Tilt Higher Ed, um, Suzanne Tapp here. Um, so she can field questions about that. Um, you can also uh, show students data. I tend to take class time and walk them through why active learning is important and I show them data. It takes time, but if you want the buy-in, it's sometimes worth it on the front end. Um, and then you can also do a practice exercise, which we have one that you can download and edit as you see fit. Um, don't worry about all of the writing here. This is just this introduction to active learning. It's a classroom activity. These are the learning goals that we came up with for the case. Um, I use this in my class and it seems to go well. Um, and it's basically listed as a Word document that individuals can tailor for use in their classroom. Um, for getting students involved and in thinking about their own learning and thinking. Um, and I like having that level of student buy-in. Okay. Um, last, I wanna learn more about this inclusive teaching, but I'm busy and I'm overwhelmed and it doesn't count for P&T, right? Depending on where you're at, um, these sorts of activities may or may not count for promotion and tenure. Um, Ryan Dewsbury has a great um, section on his website about things you can do to get like yourself into this literature. Um, we have a lot of resources listed. I know it's still overwhelming, um, but that's a good place to start. Just find a medium you enjoy, whether it's books or literature or podcasts, and um, start small, start learning, 
and just build as you go and then integrate it when you can. And if you have the ability, push for change at your institution for review criteria of faculty and educators um, and, and make it so this stuff does count. I know that's easier said than done, but, um, but there are lots of, of areas for resources and I'm sorry there's not a quick fix. I think it is just start learning and build as you go. Um, so now we want to take just a little bit for some examples from our classrooms, um, you know, examples from the field. So um, how have you challenged yourself to change what you teach and what have you learned? And then what is one challenge you faced when trying um, to kind of do this in the classroom? And whoopsies, sorry, I hit the wrong button. Um, and how do you overcome or address that challenge? So I'm very briefly going to talk about what I've done and then I'll pass it off to my collaborators and then we'll take questions. So um, right now, and I primarily teach uh, the 300 student pre-nursing physiology course. Um, along with that, we have an upper division um, biology class, which is peer mentoring. So those two piggyback, my 300 students uh, get together weekly and do case studies in groups of four. And my upper division peer mentors are um, undergraduate learning assistants, and they help mentor those students. This has been a process over several years um, that I've kind of tweaked and changed to get it to where I like it, and it's still not perfect. But I do like the setup of it's a teaching team. It's me, three graduate TAs, and about 30 um, undergraduate learning assistants. And we all make this class possible. So changes I made this year, um, I will say in 2019, in the fall, I went to a talk by Brian Dewsbury on Tex campus, and it was very good. And I'll be completely honest with you, I left that talk feeling bad about myself and a little defensive and a little angry. Um, not, at, not at Dr. Dewsbury, but mainly I realized I wasn't doing enough, and that made me feel bad, and then that made me feel defensive. And then I worked through all of that, and I started learning. And I started learning and I knew I needed to do more to talk about racism in medicine and science, but I didn't know how and I was scared. and I didn't wanna mess it up. Um, I don't know everything yet, but for the last year and a half, I've been doing a lot of personal education and growth and it's taken a lot of time and I'm very happy to be doing it, um, but it's a journey. And I'm taking what I learned and I'm integrating it full force into my class. And for me, that's a big, I'm very proud that I was able to do that. Um, so people might be like, yeah, that's kind of minor, but I'm very proud that I'm, I'm getting better at doing that. Um, so I've integrated aspects of sexism and racism very explicitly into my class because it's very relevant to medicine and STEM. Um, we've done this class online this semester. So we do Zoom breakout rooms and that's working well for the student groups, still kind of figuring out group dynamics and those who don't participate and what do we do, still working on that. Um, we're using the UDL framework for assignments. Uh, students have a relevance folder where I post a lot of different content. They have to pick one. They're like podcasts, they're reading, they're news clips, book chapters, and they pick one that most interests them. And that's going well so far. I redid the syllabus for equity. I redid deadlines. I revamped how points count. They're allowed multiple redos on assignments. Um, so I've done lots of things. And if you wanna hear more about specifics at the end, you can ask, but so far it's going well. Um, I've challenged myself to learn. I'm still learning. Um, and I think overall it's going well, but there are certainly things that, little little bumps and organizations that I'll have to continue to, to work out. Okay, I think Steph is up next. So I am, I am the unusual person here. I am a geoscientist. I actually uh, teach uh, a, most of the like the required classes in my department. Like when we have things like a geocommunication class and, and um, a professional development class, those, those are the kinds I teach. But my research interest is geomorphology and I'm allowed to teach that, which I love. And that's this semester. And it is a undergraduate graduate level piggyback class. Uh, and I'm, it has a lab. And I had the option to teach it completely online um, because I have a child with medical issues. And so I was given permission to teach online and I chose not to um, because I was terrified 
of trying to figure out how to do lab online. But I am teaching it as a high flex. So I am incorporating aspects, way more aspects of online teaching than I ever could have imagined I would in this class. Um, in, in fact, um, I have some students who can't come to campus. And so we have set it up. So for labs, students work in small groups and then there's a computer at the table and one of the online students is in their lab group and interacts with them. And any experiments they're doing, they have to talk it through with the student online. It's actually working. I was, I'm so thrilled. Um, I have become completely flexible with deadlines. I don't know if I will always be able to do that, but um, I've just, I just gave up on hard deadlines except the end of the semester. Um, I've given up on traditional exams. So we finished the first unit was on soils and landscapes. And um, they're all doing a semester long project where they have a national park and they're gonna talk about geomorphic processes in the national park. And so I created an assessment where they had to answer questions about their national park based on a tool we've used, Web Soil Survey, and answer questions that were tied to all the content areas we covered in the first. And it was four pages long. There's 18 students. It took me a week to grade. But they did amazing. Not everyone got an A, but the, but the, the interaction with the material was way more um, impressive. And I feel like I should add that this class is not all majors. I have majors in, and, and but I have education students in here. They're required to take it the, who are upper level are going to go into um, junior high, high school science education are required to take it. Um, I have students from engineering that get sent over because they need to know about landscapes for civil engineering. So I have a lot of students who don't have a geoscience background. And so this is one way that I'm addressing those different learning backgrounds um, that's really working for me. Um, and, and another thing that I've done is that all my classes, I always have my students talk about science in some way with the, with um, the their classmates. I feel like that's really important to learn communication. And one of the things I've started doing is that I've created very short presentations that the students do. Like say we're going, they're going to talk about their national parks. They have to pick a national park. And so the assignment for class that day is they have to stand up and tell their student, their classmates in a minute, what exciting thing about that national park they're going to study for the semester. And um, you can do it anywhere, you can do it online, you can do it um, in person. If they don't have regular access to the internet, I let them record it. I let them show a picture and not themselves. Um, so I just provide a, all sorts of different options for how they can submit that assignment and either do it live or do it as a recording. Um, the other thing that I've incorporated for the upper level students is we do a lot of things based on the three minute thesis model. So if you're not familiar with that, it's one slide and they have three minutes to talk about a topic or their research or whatever. And so I've, I've really started to adapt to these more online technical assignments that have multiple options. So again, they can do it in person, they can do it online, they can record it, they don't ever have to show their face. Um, if they don't want to. And my students who have anxiety about presentations have told me it's really helped them out. Um, I think the biggest pitfall is trying to do too much at once and not being comfortable with technology. I'm actually very bad with technology if it's not what I do for my research. And so I've really had to push myself in this. I've been doing active learning work um, the whole time I've been at Auburn, I started out as a brand new professor involved in our teaching and learning center and actually am now a peer mentor for other faculty with this. So if anyone ever just wants to reach out to me and talk about things, I think geosciences applications are very similar to biological sciences. Um, I have my email there at the bottom. That's it. All right, uh, that is me now. Um, it's on April Wright. I am an assistant professor at Southeastern Louisiana University. This is my fourth year here. Um, and so I teach typically uh, three courses a semester, so three, three usually. Um, one uh, course that is a staple of uh, my teaching load, I do this every semester, is genetics. And 
This semester is my first semester teaching it entirely online. It was high flex in the past, but we have so many students who are um, already working adults, uh, Southeastern, um, yeah, about 70% of the student body is first generation students and about 60% work uh, more than kind of traditional part-time hours, so 20 hours or more typically. Uh, and so for us, there are some major issues associated with uh, student resources. So who has their own personal computer, right? That's a big deal for us. Uh, who has rural internet? And particularly this year in the fall, we lost 11 instructional days, I think due to various weather emergencies. Uh, so we're, we're in a position where oftentimes if students are not on campus, they have a difficult time keeping up, right? And so for me, one of the big changes that I've made is I never have my camera on and I don't ask them to. Um, because so many of them are working unstable hours, right? I have a ton of students who work, uh, have picked up basically part-time work on COVID diagnostic testing services, particularly students who are sort of medically oriented. Uh, so they're working a lot. Um, and so I allow students to do the course asynchronously. Every day we have a minute paper. If you are in class, we'll get together in a small discussion group and just everyone will use, you know, Google Drive or something to send it to me. It's completion grade. If you are not able to be synchronous, you have 48 hours after class time to kind of get that submitted so that I, and that's that deadline is still mostly there so that I can look at them and see how well people are understanding what's going on. Um, so there's that. Um, also in that class, well, I think a lot of us are familiar with some of the rhetoric that's sort of emerged around um, what uh, its proponents like to refer to as race science. Um, you know, there's, that, that's, not a, that's not a real science, um, but a lot of it is rooted in misunderstandings, misunderstandings, often intentional misunderstandings of genetics. Uh, and so I've added a week to our curriculum where we talk, you know, very explicitly about um, genomic tests, genomic uh, mechanisms, uh, how variation is apportioned among human populations. And so that's something that's largely sort of in response to some of the larger um, social conditions right now. I'm from Minneapolis, so I've been watching uh, a lot of what was going on over the summer with a lot of interest. Um, so that that's sort of what I've been doing in genetics. Uh, I'm also going to put another paper into the chat. Uh, the other course that I teach very consistently is computational biology. And so for that, we've switched over entirely to cloud-based tools because there are enough students who do not have access to like a good laptop. Uh, so if we wanna use our studio, we can do that in the cloud uh, for I think 15 bucks a month uh, for the whole class. And so we've been doing that. Uh, something that I did for that class was I went and I dug out a bunch of monitors from Surplus <laughs> because if you're doing that online and you're trying to follow along coding, but you're also watching me do stuff on the screen, the real estate for your screen, it's just, it's not gonna work out great. So I, I just surplused a bunch of monitors uh, and just handed them out like candy uh, for the students, it was perfect. Um, so there was no investment really of their technological resources because they could interact with the code environment through their browser. Uh, and I just, you know, Got some, uh, got some equipment for them to have. Um, one thing that I'll say was effective for us was leveraging in-state networks. Uh, so for example, we are, Louisiana is a um, low income state. So we have special funding through both NSF and NIH. And we were able to use the Inbri network to get uh, laptops to support kind of bioinformatics education. So anything that touches on health the NIH does have a few pots of, uh, of money for that that might be helpful. Um, I think that's about, oh, right. One thing that I have tried, and let me grab a link to this paper as well, is I tried, um, this goes actually straight to a PDF on team-based learning where uh, you put students into teams and they sort of work with those teams throughout the semester. Um, and there was a paper in evolution, 
and ecology, this actually was in our same special issue that our paper appeared in, about using that to increase you know, student belonging in entirely online courses. This is something that I really wanted to do, uh, but it's been actually very frustrating uh, and hasn't ultimately worked out because of that issue of students working you know, many, um, many hours and having kind of unstable class attendance. So this is something that I thought we were gonna do. We we're gonna do this team-based learning and, and have students really get to know each other in the online environment but I just, I, I couldn't make it work. So if anyone has any ideas on that, I am, I am all ears. But for me, that was personally something that was a high hope and a mighty frustration. Okay, great. I think, so this, thank you both. Um, pretty much wraps it up, just reminding everyone that like, it's super hard to change the way we teach. Um, this is a paper at the bottom. It's from 2006. It's from uh, Dee Silverthorne. She writes the textbook that I used to use for physiology. I was introduced to this as a graduate student um, and I had some really great mentors that really pushed active learning. And they really did highlight this in the beginning. That's super hard to change the way we teach and that's okay. Um, so I'm really glad that I've had that mindset from the beginning of learning about teaching. Um, but there are legitimate and real concerns for faculty about time split and, and what if my students don't like it? And what about evals? And what about what counts for my ability to keep my job, right? So we're not trying to trivialize any of that or saying it's an easy fix, but start small, start your journey, pick one thing, challenge yourself to pick one thing. Um, and I found this, um, I think this was posted on Twitter. I love science Twitter. It's actually how I met some of the folks here. Um, that we worked with. I've never met Steph or April in person, um, but uh, I knew about the special issue from Ecology and Evolution based on Twitter. Um, someone commented on a post I made and that was it. Um, but uh, the syllabus challenge by Dr. Kim Case, here's a, a scan, um, me, if you want to go to her webpage, there's also a link to a direct PDF. It's awesome. It's like, what are you going to do on the side? And you like write out what you're going to do to change your syllabus. It's a super great walkthrough tool. Um, and, and with that, we'll just say thank you so much. And, and what questions do you have? Um, I see there's one in the chat already. Perfect. I want to real quick, two things. Yeah. At the end of this, I just have um, reference slides. I don't know if we want to print these out or put them somewhere. But in case you didn't catch all of the scans or all the things we referenced, I just wanted to make sure they were available. Um, so I can I can put them in a Word doc or whatever we think is, is best. So I, I can comment on that because I am using flexible deadlines pretty heavily. Um, and essentially, I have it in my syllabus and I talk about it with the students. It's like we have due dates for a reason because I'm trying to pace your effort and my ability to then give you proper feedback in a timely manner. But I just say, if you can't meet a deadline, let me know. And then I, I kind of the conversation that I have with the students is that if, if I don't get it on time, you still have to do it. But I also may not grade it as fast as you need it. Um, and what's fascinating to me is I've had fewer people ask to turn things in late as a result and fewer people panicking when something is due. Um, I really, now I do have all upper level students, like the youngest is probably like a second year or third year student. Um, so that may be part of it but they, they're doing okay. Um, some of them are waiting till the last minute. It's really obvious. Um, but that's, yeah, I just decided that for my energy level, I had to give up that right now. I did the same thing um, last semester. God, that feels like so, so <laughs> far away. In a class of 300 students, it was um, online asynchronous. I had three, a, three TAs, but one of them was not really helpful, so I wound up picking up a lot of the slack. But essentially, I told them, everything is due by November 23rd, right before Thanksgiving. Um, did that help with my teaching evaluations? In some respects, yes. In some respects, no. But I felt like it was the most humane thing to do in the middle of a pandemic. Um, it was tough on my TAs, but it seemed like, seemed like the, the morally right choice. 
And then what I'm doing this semester in a 3000 level online asynchronous class is giving everybody a one week grace period um, and then telling them it's got to be in by date X, May 1st, um, if they want to avoid a big whopping penalty. Um, and that too is interesting. You see the students, especially in online teaching, I've never done online teaching except this year. It's really interesting how the students self-select. Some of them do all the work on time and early and some of them don't do anything. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll just comment real quick and then I'll read a, a question from John. Um, I'm also using a somewhat flexible deadline. Um, I broke my class into units. So like there's four units, each unit has an exam. Students are allowed to drop one exam. Um, within that unit, there's like three weeks worth of assignments. And I just say the assignments are due before the exam for that unit. And you can take the assignment as many times as you want. It's credit, no credit. But the catch is you have to get a 70% or above to open the next week's folder. It's kind of working to help pay students. Also, some students have just never done anything for the class and I've emailed them multiple times. So I don't, I don't know how, I'm curious to see how it'll play out the rest of the semester, but it's my first time playing with flexible deadlines where I don't release a key because that's always the concern, right? So I have homeworks, there's 300 students, they're auto graded because I'm not grading 300 assignments every week. Um, but then how do you do that where if they get the answers, right? Like they're not just gonna pass them to their friend and then take turns doing that because my students do that. So I was trying to figure out a way that I could have multiple attempts and multiple due dates and still deal with like releasing scores. Um, but I, I don't know. Um, John asked about, um, so what are your thoughts on using Google Docs, breakout groups and other interactive tools on Zoom sessions? Do you think it might be too big of a risk when thinking about technology differences um, of the students in class. So I haven't come across any major issues with it. Um, so I do use breakout rooms, um, you know, uh, and, you know, I have a few students who are joined on like an iPhone and I think they might be like watching the slides on their computer, but then doing audio through the phone. And since I don't require them to have the camera on, um, that's been okay. And Google Docs is another uh, technology that you can use, you know, completely mobile if you want to. Um, but the other thing is, you know, I don't take attendance, right? So if you want to do the activity later when you're on campus in the library or you're, um, you know, you want to get together with a friend in person and like do the uh, activity hands-on, like print it out and do it and then take a picture of it that's fine by me, right? Um, as long as I as long as I get um, those in class activities at some point, so I can just, you know, assess how people are doing. Uh, as long as I get them at some point, that's okay with me. So um, I haven't had any major problems with using Google Docs, but or breakout rooms. But we might see more of those when we are doing kind of mandatory synchronous, right? Yeah, I required, so I have a synchronous portion of my asynchronous class. So the discussion, which is a separate registration is synchronous. And the syllabus just explicitly says like, you have to have some way to use Zoom just because that's how we're gonna make this work. We're gonna make the classroom feel small by you all being able to interact. You don't have to have your camera on, but you do have to have some way to like type or chat with your group. Um, and we're using OneDrive because all students have access to a OneDrive account through their tech. Um, they also get free Zoom accounts, right? Like you can, since we set it up with the, the timeline, my, my TAs do, um, that's not been an issue, but I have said in the syllabus as well, like if you have circumstances, let me know and we can figure it out, right? Like I'm happy to work with you individually if we need to figure out if we can check out a laptop for you, um, but like let me know immediately so we can get it solved. Um, and I haven't had anyone say anything, but I don't know, I can't say for sure that that didn't deter anyone from taking the class. So it's a good question, John. Are there any other um, questions or, or anything, or if people wanna share any like awesome tips they have? like waiting for our students to talk on Zoom. 
I'll give an example. I do. I'll, I'll make a quick comment. Um, this is John. And, and thank you so much for the thoughts on this. I, I just had literally not even thought about that until April, what you said about cameras. I was like, that's so true. Like there's probably some of my students that might not be able to access this, but, but I think you're right. There's, you know, you can still get to it on your phone. Um, I just was going to comment on Suzanne's comment about sending a survey. This last semester, I sent a survey in August um, before the semester started to kind of get a sense of what students were expecting. And by September, all the students had totally changed their perceptions because all of a sudden, like it was real, right? And so I think Suzanne's idea is a really good one. And I would just say, it's probably good if we do send that survey to send it after a few weeks as well to see you know, how things are going, because I think especially, and, and you know, and COVID is, is probably a unique experience, but for my students, what they thought they wanted and then how that actually played out in their real life were very different. And so we had, you know, we had, I, I sent another survey kind of after they asked me to, um, to kind of get a different perspective there too. So I think that's, that's really helpful. Awesome, thanks, John. There is one more question. Um, it says, any advice on online use of the two minute uh, writing idea or the, the minute paper? Say, so I've used um, like Blackboard journal um, like that or the discussion post for those sorts of things, either if you want it to be viewable to other uh, students or not. So like uh, journals you can make, I think group or like a discussion board could be group. I think journals can also be individual or you can do like an open-ended survey um, where you can see if they did it, but it won't be available to everyone. So those are good options. Um, I think April said she uses Google Docs um, or anyone else can, can chime in there. I do it in Canvas with discussions and you can set it so that the students don't see the discussion until you want them to and it can have a, and then they can't see the answers until they post an answer. And then I usually require them to respond to their class, at least one class minute. Great. Okay, well, I think we like ended kind of perfectly at 1.59 p.m. Uh, but if anyone else has any questions or comments, uh, feel free to, to email any of us uh, to chat. Um, check out any of the links. I'm happy to send that the whole PDF or the, the ending um, references as well to anyone. So cool. Thank you so much for coming. And so nice to see my collaborators that I've never met in person. See you later. Thank you so much for being here. We're so appreciative of your wisdom and generosity with your time. Thank you all. And great ideas from the group as a whole. What this yeah. was a, a worthwhile um, use of our time today. So I'm very, very appreciative.